it's it's my my pleasure to to introduce you to uh, Dr. Rocco Lico. He is a postdoctoral researcher in the VLBI group at uh, Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía in Granada. He uh, was previously a postdoc fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany, which is something that we share in our academic history together with Ivan too, <laughs> between 2018 and 2020. And uh, he was also at the Italian National Institute of Astrophysics, IRA INAF, uh, and the University of Bologna in Italy between 2016 and 2018, where he also got his PhD in 2015. His research interests are mainly focused on the physics of supermassive black holes and the relativistic jets. He is part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, involved in several working groups as well as in the management team. So thank you very much, Rocco, for being here today with us and for sharing your, your experience and your knowledge. Uh, please go ahead and uh, enlighten us with your <laughs> images of supermassive black holes. <laughs> All right, wow. So thank you very much. So let me, thank you for the introduction and I would like to thank you, Ivan, for inviting me to be here. So it's, it's really my pleasure. And then I would like to thank everybody who is joining now for this talk to hear what I have to say and I hope to say things that are interesting for you. And okay, now I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, you... yes, perfect. Perfect, all right. So um, I don't want today to talk about, you know, to depict the history of general relativity and of black holes and so on. I would like today, you know, just to um, give you the proper feeling and sense on how this image of the black hole was made and uh, I will try first to introduce some basic concepts which uh, will guide you through uh, until you know making this image and just to, to, to make you understand how challenging it was to do such thing and then I will try to address you know some key questions that will uh, explain what's going on here so um, of course uh, you are Studies, uh, physics students, so I don't need to introduce the electromagnetic spectrum. This is just to show uh, that we are focusing today on the radio wavelengths, you know, which are those uh, wavelengths, the, the, the lower frequency part of the spectrum, let's say. And uh, this is also just to say that the radio uh, frequencies, um, as, along with the optical frequencies, they are the only two windows which are accessible from the ground of the Earth. That means that we it's possible to observe at radio frequencies by using ground-based telescopes, you know, while when you want to observe, for example, gamma rays or X-rays, you have to launch satellites. But in our case, we can do radio astronomy from the ground by using ground-based telescopes. And now, uh, just to make you understand why is it important to investigate the universe or uh, the objects in the universe at several frequencies and at radio frequencies in particular, I'm just showing now this image. I mean, this is uh, an image of the radio sky above the Green Bank Observatory. And I mean, I can ask you the question, wh what do you see here? And maybe you can see, all right, this is just looking like, you know, uh, an optical image, just a night sky that we see in the optical. But the difference here is that in this five gigahertz radio image, every single point you see here is not a star. This is a radio galaxy. This is a quasar. This is a supernova remnants. This is uh, molecular clouds, you know, we see a totally different story here. And it's important to look at the different wavelengths just to have, you know, the comprehensive and full understanding of the whole physics that is there. Now, Rocco, excuse me, yeah. there's one thing. Uh, do you have a pointer or something or, or the arrow from your mouse to point at the images? Can you see the arrow of my mouse here? Uh, uh, we cannot. Oh, because I'm, I'm using my we mouse. If you go, if you go to the upper left corner of the of the screen now in, in Blackboard Collaborate, there is a like a, a like a lens, and uh, and there are options in which you can uh, you can choose uh, like a hand to to point. Okay, I don't see where. On the left, on the upper left corner, you have you have uh, some symbols that you can use to point. Okay, maybe I need to stop sharing. Now, now I see the arrow. Now we see the arrow. No, 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 no. It's while sharing. Now we, yeah. Okay. So, and now you can see the arrow again? No, but, but if you, you must have a, a, one of the icons somewhere on the left. You allows you, I think it's upper left corner. Allows you to use uh, a hand uh, to point on the screen. Yeah. And yeah. we can see it. I don't have anything in the upper left. But uh, not, not in the PowerPoint, but in the Blackboard Collaborate screen, right? Okay, because while sharing, 
I don't see the blackboard. This is ah uh, well, that's it. That's it. For some reason, okay, okay. I, uh, I I try to do this. In in case I have to show something, I will reuse just like all right. All right. You can see the arrow now, right? Okay. Now yes. we see the arrow. Yes. Okay. So. By the way, this is just you know to give you this idea. Then I would like to make another example, which is bringing us to the topic that we are going to discuss today. I mean, this is another uh, optical image of the sky, and this is uh, Hercules A. I mean, if you look at this at this galaxy just in the middle of the image, and I ask you what is this, you can maybe just say, all right, this is just like any other regular galaxy. You know, this, you you see this fluffy blob here and it just looks like any other boring galaxy but what if we look at the same galaxy but at radio frequencies what does it happen here so let's keep fix the view, uh, the field of view and let's see what's happen at radio frequencies so you see what we see here all this new structure this huge plasma flows here which are you know coming away from the central region which is telling us that this is not a regular galaxy this is indeed an active galaxy that is producing these out plasma outflows, which are, you know, going much farther away than the galaxy itself. Then what is going on here is not just something that is pretty regular, but there is a monster, a supermassive black hole in the center of these galaxies that is, you know, swallowing all the gas uh, around the black hole in this accretion disk. And then it's pushing away these two uh, plasma outflows which you know uh, are made of relativistic particles and mainly relativistic electrons, which are spiraling along the magnetic field lines, and they are producing what is called synchrotron emission, and this is what we detect then with radio telescopes. Now I um, try to address some key questions, like for example, all right, so now we know what the telescopes can observe, but why radio telescopes are so big, are that big? You know, you can have a super tiny optical telescope and see very nice things, but for radio telescopes, we need that big dishes. The answer here is because of resolution and because of sensitivity. I mean, these are just two very general and basic concepts, but in the case of radio astronomy and in the case of the image of the black hole we are going to talk about, they are really, really two key points here. The resolution in general, you know, for any instrument, it's just, you know, the ability to resolve two points which are uh, very close to each other. And this is inversely proportional to the uh, aperture of the dish, to the antenna diameter. That means the larger the dish, the lower this number, which means the better the resolution. This is why we need such big telescope. And the second point is because of sensitivity. Sensitivity is, you know, the ability of uh, detecting faint structure, faint sources. And this is proportional to the square of the antenna diameter. That means the larger the dish, the better the sensitivity. This is why we need such big dishes. And now you can say, all right, but this is something which is general for any instrument. But in the case of radio astronomy, what we are dealing with is very faint sources. I mean, let me say, when we observe extragalactic radio sources, the power that we hope to, to observe is around one Jansky. I mean, when we have a one Jansky source, it's already a super you know, bright source. And the Jansky is a unit that we use in radio astronomy that is defined like this. It's this tiny number is 10 to the minus 26 watt per Hertz per square meters. I mean, this is what we really are trying to observe. You know, it's just like a tiny thing. And to give you an idea, somebody also made an estimate that all the energy from outside the solar system that was ever received by all radio telescopes on Earth since this, the first radio telescope was built, is less than the energy of a single snowflake that it is eating the ground. I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is just serious. And this is why it's so challenging. And this is what we are trying to, to do. This is why sensitivity is a key point here. And to explain this even better, I just set up this uh, kind of virtual experiment, like this virtual conference we are doing today. And uh, please correct me because I've never been in Valencia, but this is what I saw from Google Maps. So this is a map of Valencia, and this is the Institute of Physics where I think you are studying there. And this is the Ciudad de las Ciencias, which is, I think, like about 10 kilometers apart, right? And if we try to set up this experiment, like if we try to put a radio telescope on the roof of the physics department, and at, in this image here at La Ciudad de las Ciencias, you can see this guy here is talking to his smartphone you see and you know what is the power that these radio telescopes ideally will receive from this guy talking to his smartphone at 
10 kilometers far away from the antenna, I just made the actual calculation here, and the power that receives is this number. It's like 10 to the 10 Jansky. I mean, in this case, this power is like about 10 billion times stronger than the brightest source we see in the sky. I mean, this is just to give you the sense of how challenging it was to make this image of the black hole in terms of sensitivity. And here I'm just showing you just a few radio telescopes just to show you how uh, in the history of radio astronomy, we try to build uh, as much large as possible dishes for radio telescopes. This is actually the largest one in the world with a diameter of half a kilometer. You know, it's, it's, it's really something huge. And to give you an idea of how good uh, such telescope can be, or how bad, I don't know, this is the point of view. So I just try to answer this question. I mean, how large should a radio telescope be just to achieve you know, a resolution which is at least as the one of our human eyes, which is around one arc minute? I mean, the resolution of our human eyes is not a good resolution, but just let's try to see how big should this dish be, just to have the same uh, resolution of, as humans. And the answer is around 700 meters. This means that even the largest radio telescope in the world, single dish radio telescope in the world, has a resolution which is worse than our human eyes. This is really a, a problem, I mean, and if we just push this further and we just make the actual calculation to see how much this should be to have a resolution as good as the one of optical telescopes, which is, you know, around one arc second, then the answer is 43 kilometers. I mean, could you believe we need to build a full dish of 43 kilometers just to achieve the same resolution, which is practically impossible, you know? Uh, it, it's impossible from an engineer point of view. You, you, can, you can construct something like this. But let me say that even though I'm just showing you this, uh, let me tell you that in with radio astronomy, we can achieve the, the highest angular resolution ever achieved by any other telescope at any other frequency on Earth. And again, I'm not kidding, guys. This is, the answer here is interferometry. I mean, you are, again, all physics students. I mean, and you all know for sure this uh, experiment of the double slit uh, for the interference pattern by Thomas Young. And here, please, please interrupt me if I say something you don't understand, please. And here, you know, we just apply this interferometric technique by uh, changing, you know, these slits here with two, we replace the two slits with two radio telescopes and we try to produce this interference pattern. And then, you know, we can play the same game by adding as many post uh, telescopes as we can. In this case, this is an array of 27 antennas over 30 kilometers. And you know what is the good thing here? That now the resolution is not anymore inversely proportional to the aperture of a single dish, but it's proportional to the maximum distance of two antennas, which means, of, of, of yes, of the antennas, which means that in this case, this instrument here is simulating a radio telescope with a virtual diameter of 30 kilometers. Now, you know, now this is very interesting and now we are really getting serious here. And this is what the kind of images that we can get with such an instrument this is called the JVLA. This is a 20 centimeter image of the radio galaxy M87. And of course, if I show him now this image here of this galaxy, this is because, you know, the actual picture of the, black, the famous picture of the black hole was made for this galaxy here. And now I'm trying to guide you through the, the image that was made by, you know, starting from the lower resolution. You know, we see this very nice jet and we have this resolution here, which is around 1000 light years. But all right, this is good, but the limitation of such kind of instrument is that the single elements of the interferometer are connected each other with like optic fibers and so on. That means that at some point there is a limitation in the sites because of the dispersion of the signal and so on. But this was solved by improving the technique by using antennas which are not uh, connected, directly connected, but they are spread on a longer distance. And in this case, this is another array, which is called the Very Long Baseline Array, which has, you know, this is uh, of 10 antennas spread in the North America uh, over a distance of around 9,000 kilometers, which means 
that now with this uh, instrument, which is using this technique of, uh, element, of, of elements which are not connected, and it's called very long baseline interferometry, we are simulating a virtual telescope with a diameter of 9,000 kilometers. I mean, this is like we have a telescope with this such a big diameter. And now this is the kind of images that we can get. So this is the previous image, and this is now the new image. Now you see we can really now zoom into the core region of the source here on M87, and we can now really detect very interesting and very nice uh, features and details here. Now you see the resolution here is around three light years. This is what corresponds to three light years. Sorry, you cannot see my pointer, but I, I hope this is clear. And now you can say, all right, you have this huge virtual telescope with such a diameter of around 9,000 kilometers. Wow, this is great. This is awesome. But you know, we want to push this further. We are not yet satisfied with this, and we're going to really go deeper and deeper here. And for this reason, there are other instruments like this one that is the Global Millimeter GMV, uh, VLBI Array called GMVA that is using telescopes all, all, all over different continents, you know, and now we can really cover baselines. The baseline is just the distance of two antennas uh, of the order of 10,000 kilometers. And we are even going now to an higher frequency. And, you know, with such an instrument, we are now really able to make that beautiful images like this, you know, now we are really zooming and going deeper into the core region of M87 of this galaxy. And now we can really see the inner structure of the jet and the core region and so on. Now you see the resolution here is still improving and improving. It's 0.3 light years. All right, now you say, great, you have antennas on different continents. This is an awesome thing. This is an awesome achievement. But we didn't really get the actual black hole here. I mean, we really want to push this at the limit, and we really want to unveil the black hole that is hiding here in the central regions. For this reason, the Event Horizon Telescope project was created. I mean, this is something that is going on since several years, but you know, uh, finally we could converge only uh, in 2019 because you know we need the technological development and so on. And this array is now made; it was made up of eight telescopes spread all over the globe, not only in different continents. That means that with such an instrument, we are now simulating a telescope with a virtual size of, of the earth, earth diameter. I mean, this is like the Earth itself is a radio telescope. Now we are really happy. This is simply awesome. And you know what is the resolution that we can achieve with such kind of instrument? This is something like 20 micro arc seconds at 1.3 millimeters. I mean, I can say now as many number I can, but maybe you don't get it. To make you really understand what we are talking about here, I just make a super practical example. And what we are trying to do here is like we are trying from the Earth to resolve the end of the rover, of the lunar rover that was left, you know, on the moon. And I mean, you can see how difficult could be such kind of things and maybe how crazy could be this thing. You know, another example that many people make is like they're trying to resolve a tennis ball on the moon. You know, this is really incredible. And now with this Event Horizon Telescope, now we can really go here and finally we got it. Now we really unveil the monster that is sitting there and that is producing these huge outflows which are going on out of the core region and so on. And this is the resolution that now we can achieve. And let me give you um, the sense of the sides here we are talking about. I mean, the solar system is like contained here in this darker region here. This is Pluto's orbit. This is just, you know, a bit larger than the, solar, the entire solar system. And I mean, that was great. And uh, this image here, may, many things were said about this image. I mean, they say, many people say this is, the image of the actual black hole. They say this dark area here is the black hole. Somebody else said, all right, this is the event horizon. Or others said, okay, this is the efficient disk. I want now to clarify this point and I want now to clearly express and clearly show what is this thing we are looking here. I mean, everybody, I'm sure everybody saw this image, but let's now try to understand what this image really represents. And I'm doing this now with this uh, simulation here. So here we are now zooming into uh, 
the core region of this uh, active galactic nucleus here, a nucleus here, where we have the black hole in the central region that is, you know, swallowing all the gas and all the photons just uh, around, spiraling around and producing these two jet outflows. And let me stop here the animation. You know, these are the photons that are just close to the black hole that are crossing the black hole. Oops, sorry. All right. Ah. Sorry, let me come back. Oh my gosh, sorry. And uh, this is, all right. So these are the photons that are you know, going around the black hole. There is this, this blue, I don't know if you can see the color here. This blue spot here is the event horizon. And these are the photons just going close by to the black hole, which are, are following uh, bent and curved trajectories, you know, because of the gravitational field, of the strong gravitational field of the black hole. It's just exactly like the herd rotating era, era, era around the sun. Okay, I did it again, sorry for this. Around the sun. And all these photons, some of them are totally swallowed by the black hole. But when they are out quite far away, they are bent and they can reach the observer that in this case is here. And these are the photons that we see in the actual picture. You know, this is what we see in the image I showed before. And now there is a simulation just overlapping. And then this is, you know, the actual image we got there. Now you can say, all right, this image with respect to the simulation, it's like a little bit blurry. It's like a bit fuzzy. It's not that, I mean, uh, so high definition <laughs> image, let's say, but as I said before, what we are trying to do here is like, we are trying to resolve a tennis ball on the moon. And I also mentioned how difficult it was to get such faint sources there. So now let's try to understand this um, from uh, with a sketch. That was just an animation. So here there are two examples. We have a non-rotating black hole and a maximally rotating black hole. Here in the center, we have the event horizon. Okay, let me now do this because maybe you don't see my pointer here. All right, I do like this. So we have the event horizon here and the photons that are crossing the event horizon, you know, they are just totally swallowed by the event horizon, not only the one that directly hit the horizon, but even the other which are close enough. The first photons that can, you know, escape the gravitational field here are those photons which reach a distance of 2.6 Schwarzschild radii. I mean, the Schwarzschild radius is the radius of the event horizon uh, that is defined in this way. You know, it's directly proportional to the mass of the black hole. That means the larger the mass, the larger the uh, event horizon. Which means here that the first photons that we are able to see are the photons at this instance. So what we see in, the, in this dark area here is indeed this shadow is the shadow cast by the black hole. Uh, and this is called the photon ring, which is the first, the closest distance, let's say, to the event horizon where we can see the actual, the actual photons. So just to answer to this question, is this the image uh, of the black hole? Is this the image of the event horizon? What this image is showing us is actually the photon ring. And in the other case of a maximally rotating black hole, this is again the shadow. And this is the estimated size, which is you know, not so much smaller than the one of a non-rotating black hole. And I'm showing you this example here just to show you how the size of the shadow we are seeing is not so um, strongly dependent from the, the, the spin of the black hole, but it's mainly dependent from the mass of the black hole, you know, because this is the actual formula of the shadow, which is proportional to the structured radi radius which is proportional to the mass of the black hole. That means the larger the mass, the larger the shadow. And in the case of M87, it's uh, been estimated to be around 40 microseconds. And in the case of Sagittarius star, around 50 microseconds. So now I, I tried here to address uh, another key question. I mean, the whole uh, event horizon experiment was designed uh, for two targets mainly, which are the supermassive black hole at the center of our, our galaxy, which is Sagittarius A star, and for M87, uh, the black hole at the center of M the galaxy M87. And the reason why we just choose these two targets, I mean, why just these two targets, is said here in this plot, where we have the apparent uh, angular diameter uh, of the photon capture ring, which is the one I just described here in the previous slide, versus, you know, the luminosity distance. 
And as you can see here, so this blue uh, dot line here represents the 20 microsecond resolution, which is the nominal resolution of the instrument, as I said before. And, you know, these only two guys here are just Sagittarius A star and M7, which are, you know, eligible for being for showing this shadow, which is can be resolved by our instruments. That's the reason. Another key question is, uh, many people were expecting the Event Horizon collaboration to release on um, April 2019 as the first image of the Bacol, the one of Sagittarius A star. But the first image actually was the one of M87. And many people said, all right, why? <laughs> Here is the reason why, because I mean, many people just say, all right, so Sagittarius A star is just much closer than M87, which is, you know, like 55 million light years apart. I mean, M87 is like 2000 times far away than, uh, farther away than Sagittarius A star. But we have also to take into account the mass, because as we said before, is the mass that is determining the size of the photon ring and of the event horizon. I mean, the mass of M87 is 1,500 times more the mass of Sagittarius A star, which means that even the event horizon of M87, of the black hole in the center of M87, is 1,500 times the size of the event horizon of Sagittarius A star. And in this sketch here, the um, blue ring here is representing the photon ring of M87, while the, uh, this red point here is Sagittarius A star. And you see, the time that photons take to go around, you know, to go around this ring here of M87, it's like on time scale of few days. I mean, it, one photon take just a few days to make a full, you know, circle here around the M87 in the horizon. While for the case of Sagittarius A star, it only takes a few minutes, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. This means that the variability time of Sagittarius A star is much smaller than the variability time we see in M87. And this means that trying to make an image of Sagittarius A star is just like trying to make an image of a moving target. This is why it was so challenging, even more challenging than making the image of M87. And this is why we are now focusing and we are devoting our efforts within the collaboration on trying to make a movie of Sagittarius A star rather than an image. And just try, you know, to see and to track the evolution of the source within uh, the observing time we got. All right, now you understood why uh, we observed these two targets. Now you know why uh, M87 first. Um, now you know what the image of the black hole represents. And just to uh, you know support what I just said, these are uh, we observed M87 for four different days in 2017 in April 5, 6, 10, and 11. And these are the four images for the four different days. And you see that here, they are quite fairly stable. You know, there is some variability, of course, but it's just a variability on time scale of days. And all images are very consistent. But if you do the same thing for Sagittarius A star, of course, you see much more variability. This is why it was so challenging. And another thing I forgot to write here in this presentation is, for example, um, of course, something you see here is that in the image of the black hole, there is this asymmetry. I mean, the bottom part is much brighter than the upper part. Why? What's the reason for that? I mean, the reason for that is that the black hole we are observing here is spinning. And this is the called Doppler beaming effect. This is the same effect we have for the sound waves. For example, this is the classical example that is made, you know, uh, when we have an ambulance approaching to us, we can hear that the uh, sound is much stronger than when the ambulance is, you know, uh, passing by. And the same thing is for the light. You know, the approaching side here of the black hole while rotating is brighter than the side that is going pointing in the opposite direction. And this thing is also telling us the direction of the rotation here. Indeed, the black hole in M87 is clockwise rotating. And this is essentially the reason why you see this distorted and this asymmetric shape here. All right, now I try to describe the whole process of the observations and how uh, this experiment was made. You know, um, as we said, we have this bunch of radio telescopes um, across the world who are collect, who also, of course, have some atomic clocks and making the timestamps. 
and then are collecting these uh, analog signals, transforming them, converting them into digital signals, and then they are stored into our disks, which are then shipped uh, in the actual place where we have two dedicated supercomputers, which are called correlators. One is in US at the MIT and one is in Europe at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. And after correlating and calibrating the signals, then we use several dedicated algorithms to get the actual image. This is in few words how the full process um, work and how the full process was conducted. And let me say that uh, if you just wonder why you have to ship you know, the, the, the R disk, I mean, and not just send this to the internet. I mean, the, the answer here is that the number of um, the amount of data that these antennas collected for these experiments is something like of the order of a few petabytes. It's like like something like 3.5 petabytes. You know, it's just a huge amount of data with, that you cannot simply transfer through the internet. And the very nice thing here is that after this, the whole process is going on, after the correlation, after the calibration, and after the image reconstruction, from these 3.5 petabytes. What is left there is just a single, like a few megabyte image. And this is simply awesome. You know, this is something that is stunning. And to make you understand better how the whole process works and how this observing process um, works, I made this um, example that I hope you can enjoy. And I mean, that I hope it can be clear for you. I mean, I was just trying to uh, imagine like this image of the black hole is like a song. And what of telescopes are producing, the measurements of telescopes are just the single note that make the song. And you know, uh, this is how the VLBI works. Every single pair of telescope is producing a single note and uh, the pitch of every single note is just determined by the distance, by the baseline you know, of two antennas. That means the larger the distance, the higher the pitch of the note. And then you know, uh, the more telescopes you have, the more notes you have. And let me make this super practical example here. So this is just a song. And here now we have two single telescopes and they are producing, you know, just a few notes for the song. Now I will try to reproduce the song. Please let me know if you hear it. This is just a few piano notes. I hope you can hear these notes. Yes. All right, great. These two telescopes are just producing a few, you know, low pitch notes. If I ask you to tell me which song is this, you just can say, okay, we don't have enough information. So to have more information, let's add another antenna. So we put in a telescope here with a longer baseline, and now we have some higher pitched notes. All right, now we have a few more notes. So more telescopes, more notes, you know? That means more information for the song and for the image, but still we cannot recognize the song. Let's put a, 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 sorry, a phone antenna here on the south pole, and now we have more higher pitch notes. You know, we have these two notes here. All right, now we have, you know, more information, and we need to try to reconstruct the final song from this few information. Let's include other two stations, one in the north pole and one in Mexico here. Now we have, you know, even more notes here, and the song, it's a bit more clear. Okay, maybe you can already recognize the song if you like Beethoven. All right, uh, maybe somebody can recognize this, I say. But the idea is that as many telescopes as you can include here, and the notes you have, and the more details you have. So this is actually the final song, and the final number of notes that we can get if we could include as many antennas as possible. Oops, sorry, as many antennas as possible. In the world. Right? This is like the final image of the whole thing. All right, I hope you get it. So now I'm showing here this plot that is um, the UV uh, plane. I mean, let me say just a few words here. I don't go much into details because of course I don't have time for this, but what radio telescopes measure is just a set of complex visibilities which sample the uh, Fourier trans uh, components of an image. You know which are made of a phase and of an amplitude. And these components are then put in this plane here, which is called UV plane, where U and V are just, you know, the um, uh, projected baselines as seen from the source. And the idea is that as much coverage we have in this plane, and the better we can determine the image. 
what I want to show here is that you can see that we only have few points in this plot, which means that we only have a few nodes. And from these few nodes, we have to recognize the final song. As you have seen before, it's difficult to recognize the final song with only a few notes. And what we did here is just to develop algorithms to fill these gaps, you know, just to try to fill these missing notes. And for doing this, another technique we used, because, you know, a, a single baseline here just produced a single point in this plane. I mean, you can see here on the right, we have two data points here. Okay, let me do this. We have one point here and one point here because we have just here a single baseline. However, if we use the technique called Earth rotation synthesis, you know, as the Earth rotates, the projected baselines is changing and we can sample a slight different frequency. And so we can sample more and more frequencies. This is why in this plane you see some continuous lines rather than just single points. And let me show you this simulation here. You can see as the Earth rotates, we have more and more frequencies and more and more telescopes joining here. And this plane is filling, this means we are adding more and more nodes to our score. And from these nodes here, this is the final thing we have, we should recognize the song. And for doing that, this, as I said, to try to fill the gaps, to try to simulate these nodes, uh, ad hoc algorithms were developed. But let me say why this is difficult and why this is challenging, why this is not, you know, an easy game to play. Because, because you know, the point is that when you only have a few nodes, there are many songs that can fit in these few nodes. And this is, there are so many images, like there are infinite images that can really be represented by this sparse UV coverage that we got there. So that means this is why it's challenging. And among this infinite number of possibilities, we had to rank all this possibility and we have to choose the one that is perfectly fitting the one we have until reaching, you know, the final image we got. And this is just because we have only a few nodes. And from this limited number of nodes, we have to unambiguously recognize the final image. I mean, as I said at the beginning, what I'm trying to do in this talk is not to make the issue of black holes. It's just to give you the sense of how challenging everything was. I mean, this is why this was a huge challenge in science. And I mean, some other challenges here are, you know, we are trying here to make an image of a black hole, you know, to make an image of something that was never made before. That means we don't have any other prior information to compare with. I mean, when you make an image of a source, you can say, okay, this image was made at these other frequencies and it's pretty similar, it's consistent and so on. But in our case, it's just the first one, it's just the very first one. And then we are using, you know, an, an, an array, a telescope, which was never used before because this telescope was just, this array was just made for this purpose. So we don't know the performance, the performances of these telescopes. So this is why it was so challenging and we can just show our own image. That's why it was so important to pick up the proper one. And then this is already enough, you know, this is already super difficult. But if you then put there the fact that we only have a sparse sampling, I mean, for this image that we don't know how it look like before we make it, we also have a super sparse sampling. And I mean, we have just a few notes and we have to recognize the final two from these few notes. That means we have to develop all these different algorithms to do it. And then the third challenge is that observations with this very long baseline interferometry technique at 1.3 millimeters were never done before. And the reason is simple. The reason is that because millimeter observations are very challenging because are very difficult. And here I just listed a few uh, things that came to my mind, but even is super expert in this, maybe even can inclu include here even more and more bullets. I mean, uh, sources at millimeter wavelengths are very compact and very faint. This is already very difficult. Then, you know, at going to higher and higher frequencies, the efficiency of the antenna is reduced, always reduced. So then such kind of observations are limited from the weather because here, you know, the atmosphere is playing an important role. So for example, in the case of a millimeter VRBI, the atmospheric coherence time is as short as a few seconds. And this means that we have in our data such rapid phase variations that it's super difficult to reconstruct, you know, the proper phase. And then 
going to higher and higher frequency, we have pointing errors due to the smaller antenna beam size, which is producing in turn amplitude errors. You know, it's like, I don't know how to say it. It's like, it, it, it's like being in a labyrinth with bombs. And so, I mean, it, it's, it's super difficult to get it. This is why it was very tough to do this. And this is why this image, the day after it was out, it went viral. Because this is really a huge achievement in science. It's not just an image, but it's what this image represents. And is that what is behind, what stands behind this image that is really and was really challenging. And this is really what it was done here. It's really stunning. Now, I mentioned about all these limitations, but I mentioned uh, to the infinite possibilities of images filling the data we have. So you can ask yourself, how did we finally solve this problem here? So we used several approaches. I listed here again a few of these approaches. Again, even is a super expert and can add anything if he wants. So one of these approaches was to use the blind imaging technique. I mean, what we did here was to create uh, four several four independent uh, team of scientists working at the same data and trying to reconstruct, you know, the image by using totally different methods and totally different approaches in a blind way. I mean, there were just four teams in four different rooms which were locked and only at the end the images were compared. And this is an excellent way to remove human biases in images. What, 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 I, what do I mean with this? I mean, when making uh, such kind of image, as I said before, there are many complications, for example, for the phase errors, for the amplitude errors. And in some cases, you know, because of the bad performance of a station, you may decide, maybe one team is deciding to remove the antenna. Another team can decide to use these visibilities, to use these amplitudes, but to correct this in such a way. You know, you have to do some human actions and some choices that can determine then the final image. This is why we need to avoid this bias. And if we do this in four independent times, and then we get something that is consistent, then we are on the safe side. Indeed, these are the four images that were obtained from the front teams, which you see, they are pretty consistent. This was, you know, just the first approach. Then another strategy we used was to use three different independent data processing pipelines for calibrating the data. And then again, three and now even more independent imaging algorithms. I mean, you see here these three images in the second row, uh, which are produced, okay, let me, this, these three images here in the second row, which are produced by three different independent techniques and uh, software and algorithms. And again, you see that image is super consistent by using totally different approaches here. Another thing we did, um, of course, as I said, we created some algorithms which were, you know, just made for this purpose, but we need to train our algorithms to such kind of image. And for doing this, the algorithms were trained with some synthetic data, not real data. Synthetic data of images that were, you know, uh, among these infinite possibilities which were fitting our data. Like here you can see uh, some of these uh, synthetic images which were like a, crescent, like a ring, like a crescent, like a disc, like a double, which are totally different from the actual image of the code, but they can be, you know, consistent with the data. And we turned the algorithms with this uh, kind of uh, synthetic images, and then uh, an extensive library of general relativistic magneto hydrodynamic simulations were uh, was produced, and then extensive parameter searches were made until you know converging to the fiducial parameters and to the fiducial image final image of MT7 that we got. So again, this is just to give you the feeling and the sense of the huge amount of work that was behind this single image which was done in tens of years, not just in one year, but it's going since several decades, you know, this process. Now, behind the image itself, which as I just show in all my slides, it was super challenging. Why this image is important and what this image is telling us? I mean, this image is a direct proof, actually, of the existence of the event horizon, which is already, you know, very good, you know, uh, it's already a great achievement. And then what it's doing, this image here, what is it representing? It's just, you know, we are making here a mathematical concept into an actual physic physical entity. 
And then, you know, this is up to now the strongest direct evidence of the existence of supermassive black holes. Another thing that we see in this image, as I explained before, uh, because the, you know, the, the bottom part is brighter than the top part, is that black holes do actually spin. I mean, this is again something that we know from the theory, but now we are proof, this is a real proof that black holes do spin. And in the case of uh, the specific case of M87, this is, you know, clockwise rotating. Then this is, you know, uh, a validation of the general relativity, relativity theory in the strong gravity, uh, gravity regime. And then again, you know, there are, I mean, again, here I, I'm just listing some things that can, came to my mind while I was preparing this presentation, but there are really a lot of more things that, I mean, maybe uh, Ivan or Manuel, you can add, or you can just take a look at the papers. But some other things that came to my mind is that with this image, we can also validate independently the mass estimates. I mean, you know that the mass of the black hole can be estimated in several ways. And with this image, when we can directly estimate the size of the event horizon by using the formula that I showed you before, we can back extrapolate the mass of the black hole. And by comparing this with all the other mass estimates we have, we can validate what is the best method. And actually, what we did here was to obtain a mass for M87, for the black hole in M87, which was very, very close to the one estimated by the stellar dynamics, which actually seems to be the most accurate method. And then also um, jet launching models were tested. Here I'm just Yes, mentioned something like the Blend Force Nyack model, but of course my time now is is gone. This is now actually 14 minutes just now. So if you are interested in this, uh, you can take a look at the papers and you can find a lot of more things. But let me say that the best is yet to come. I mean, this is awesome. This is stunning. But we are now, you know, uh, planning to release images of other targets. Of more telescopes are being uh, included. Higher frequencies are being observed. So I mean, in the next month. Please expect uh, big news and stay tuned for, for this. And I'm very happy to take questions and I hope uh, you enjoyed this talk. I hope I didn't bother you. <laughs> All right. I'm no way, no way. Thank you very much, uh, Rocco. It was uh, an excellent talk. I uh, would like uh, the students to, to raise questions for our speaker. You, can, you know you can raise your hand. Well, they are, they are sometimes shy. They took like two to four minutes to start asking questions to me. Yeah, there is one. Okay, Sergio. Please. Hi, uh, Rocco, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. And maybe you have said it because my listening in English is not very good, but <laughs> still, no at the beginning of, the, of your talk, you said that the, the bigger the antenna, or the, the, the telescope, the, the more resolution you have, no? Yes. And that's why you combine several uh, telescopes in the surface of the Earth to build a really huge one. And this way you have uh, a really fine resolution to yes. image black holes far, mm -hmm. far away. And the question is, is there an ongoing project to make this same thing, but using antennas that can be placed in satellites orbiting the Earth or orbiting planets bigger than the Earth? So this way the telescope is even bigger? Yes, that, that's an excellent question. Thanks for the question. So. Of course, this is something that was already considered and actually, uh, I don't have extra slides but there is already an ongoing experiment, actually not ongoing, but just ended, that is called Radio Astron, which is an actual uh, satellite um, with you know, uh, some sorry. Yeah, I don't, I, that's it, that's it, now. Oh, perfect, perfect. So, uh, this was already done actually uh, by combining a satellite with ground based telescope. Uh, this was done um, in the 19th uh, with a Japanese satellite, and it was done uh, recently with a Russian satellite, which is called the Radio Astron. And actually, the baseline that was achievable here was like 
a, around eight Earth diameters. And you can guess now how the resolution uh, can be awesome. Indeed, this, this was done, and this is also being considered for the EHT. The only problem here is here that, as I said, um, we don't only need the resolution, but we only need sensitivity. You know, that means that we have a lot of um, antennas here on the ground, but then we also have this huge gap between the satellite and the Earth. So that means that this is, of course, doable, but is still even more challenging. This is why this was not considered now, but this is something that is in our plans. And if you are interested in this, you look for Radio Astron on Google, you can find many images already produced for several uh, black holes and IGN, like TC84 and many others. Actually, uh, I think Ivan and, and certainly myself have participated in this, this project. Uh, well, more questions? Sergi? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, regarding the, the, the antennas, so you don't need to, it's because I saw the image in the slide 16. Here, for example, in this slide, you see that all the antennas are, or at least they have the same spacing, right? So, in the slide 16, you don't need to, to get the same space. So, how you reconstruct then the data? You don't need to reconstruct or, or to get at least antennas with the same spacing? All right, perfect. Thank you for the question. I mean, actually, um, let me show you. In this slide here, uh, the antenna has the same spacing uh, just because this is uh, in a relaxed mode. I don't know how to say. It. I mean, this is just not observing now. But like, these antennas like, here are like just, are just simplify sitting, things. Yeah, are just sitting on trails and they can be moved apart. You know, and the point is that the different distance between antennas, the better is because different distances among antennas can sample different frequencies. And you know, to fill this, uh, where is it? To fill this plane here, you need telescopes with many possible different distances just to fill this gap here. And so, yeah, you, you can easily rec uh, reconstruct the image even with different distances. I mean, they don't need to stay to have the same distance. I see. So you need at least two antennas to get the red line, right? Yes, of course, yes. Because this okay, is okay. Yeah. I have another question regarding the, the spinning of the black hole. Mm -hmm. So you know it is spinning because of the brightness on the bottom of the picture? Uh, what do you mean? Say again, please. It, you know it's a spinning or you confirm that it's spinning because you have more brightness on the bottom of the picture? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So this means that the black hole is rotating from down to up? No. It's rotating from clockwise. I mean, what you have here is that being rotating, you have something that is approaching you and something that is going in the opposite direction, right? Because this is rotating. And this is why you have an announced part and a dimmed part. It's like the Doppler factor for the sound waves, but this is for light. I mean, the photons that are, are approaching us are brighter. The photons that are just going in the opposite direction are dimmer. Okay. And this is just the Doppler effect, but this is, of course, in relativistic con con conditions, because it is called relativistic dimming. Yeah. And but the you, this, sorry, yeah. Sergi, you have to take into account that, well, you see, you see the, the light is, is like, uh, projected on the plane of the sky. So um, you, you see you see everything, I mean, from, from your perspective. And it's rotating clockwise means that, that you have the, the light, the light rays, uh, so that the black hole forces the, the light rays there to, to turn uh, in that direction. But uh, of course, of course, you, you are getting them from behind, right? The, the, the black hole, right? So it's, it's kind of, you have to, I mean, you are seeing this also at a, at a viewing angle to the, to the axis of rotation. So you have to, to make like a 3D composition, right, Rocco? I mean, this is something yeah. like to yeah. recover. Yeah. Yeah. I have an image for this, but yes, of course, we also have the lights coming from the back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So right. here in this image, here in this image, in the middle, rotating. So this yeah. means it's rotating clockwise in the transfer plane, right? In the picture yes. you have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
So and um, another thing is we don't see any 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 uh, any light in the black hole in the middle of the image because the creation disk is in the transfer plane. Okay. Uh, say again, please. Uh, go to the image of the black hole, not here. I don't know. Uh, this one, for example. Okay, here where the orbit of Pluto is. Mm -hmm. You don't have any kind of brightness there in the middle, crossing the image, because the accretion disk is in the transfer plane. So the accretion disk is outside here. I mean, this is what we see yes, here. Yes, I know, I know, I know. It's in in the, in the. But I wanted to know if it is. Uh, I don't know how to say it in the horizontal, the, forwarding the the our view, or it's in the transfer plane. I mean, okay, it's almost, you know, uh, I would say almost perpendicular to the sky, but exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. I mean, the jet that is coming this way is almost pointing toward us, let's say, mostly. So the the disk is in the plane of the sky, yes. Okay, okay. So if not, if, if they were in the, in the horizontal axis, more or less, we look something like the image of interstellar, for example. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Like the interstellar one, yes. <laughs> okay, got it. But, but, but blurred, but blurred. Thanks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, more questions? Have time for a couple more questions? If not, I, I, I have one. I mean, do um, you think it's going to be possible to observe any other black holes in the future? Uh, with space VLVI and how long this would take to, to, to see other sources in detail like, well, close by AGN, like uh, NGC 1052 or uh, Centaurus A, sources like that. That would be one. And the other one, if we can only see these two, mm -hmm. um, only is quite a lot already, uh, <laughs> uh, could we, I mean, by following the... Um, the evolution in time of the system, uh, can you, I mean, develop a bit on the things we will learn from that? Yeah, I mean, actually, um, this plot is not showing uh, the, the, the sources that can be imaged with the HT. It's just showing the two sources whose black, whose um, photon ring can be resolved. Uh -huh. yeah. But we can, in principle, observe any other source with the HT, including, like, as you said, the yeah. heavy and the NGC. So these are the only two sources for which we can, you know, resolve the actual photon ring. But for example, uh, on two months, ago, less than two months ago, uh, another paper was published from the HT about 3.2279. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I used it in my talk. I told, I yeah, great, great. You know, <laughs> and more is to come because we are working yes. on 3.27 and on Centaurus A, uh, Centaurus A and on other sources. So in principle, many other sources can be observed. And what we can learn, you know, it's just the internal structure. So, for example, in the case of 3C279, as you have seen, what we found is that the orientation of the core component was different from the one we saw at the lower resolution. That means, you know, there is a different geometry and maybe a different mechanism acting there. So this is the kind of things that we can uh, discern with such kind of observations. And of course, we can achieve, you know, the highest possible resolution. And to answer to your second question, um, actually there is um, an, a parallel project which is called the New Generation EHT. That is, you know, the like the EHT 2.0, you know. And uh, there are uh, ideas for developing, you know, um, the inclusion of satellites. Somebody also mentioned, you know, just putting a telescope on the moon. You know, maybe oh, yeah. this, is, that's, this is still that's an, old, an old project. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> to reality. Sure, maybe this is still science fiction, but there are uh, efforts ongoing on this. And actually, the new generation EHT telescope is something that is already ongoing. It's just we are claiming for uh, being, uh, you know, having for fundings. So this is something which is, yeah. I mean, not for the next months, but for the next years for sure. But in the next months, you, as I said before, you can expect images of other uh, sources like Centaurus A, like OJT7, and so on. Okay, good. I think there was somebody uh, was raising his hand. Yep. Um, who was that? Uh, I saw. So there are questions. Maybe it was by mistake. Um, yeah. Well, one, so, one, one extra comment, Manel. One extra comment about your first question is that 
we are going to observe at higher frequencies. That means more resolution. No good. More, so, so there can be new sources that may be resolvable, whose 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 yeah. uh, shadows may be resolvable. And on no. the other hand, you have that all this 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 figure that we see now is based on mass estimates that may not be uh, accurate enough. So maybe we have slightly higher masses for some of these objects that makes them resolvable. So, so who knows? we may, may be able to see shadows on other black holes. As well. Yeah, yes, like the sources I, I mentioned, which are very close by. That's, that's really yeah, indeed, indeed. OK. As our tier, we have more telescopes and higher frequencies being considered. So that's why I say the best is yet to come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. <laughs> OK, if, if there's one quick question, we can get it. Please don't be shy. You have a chance to ask. Don't waste it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so well, the discussion was very interesting so far. So if nobody is uh, asking, I would just like to thank Rocco again for, for making the effort to, to prepare this talk and, and to be with us today, even if it's virtually. Hope next year it can be physically here so you can visit our, our town. And um, now that you're close. And uh, well, thank you again and uh, all the best for your stay in, in Granada. Thank you very much for inviting me. That was really my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you everybody for attending. <laughs>